great to be here today, guys. And Andrew, thanks for warming up the crowd and uh, get to heat things up a little bit more. So what I'm here to talk to you about today is not just the theory behind Identity 3.0, but what MyWave is doing to make this a reality. And the, our first project is launching live in November. So it's here now, not in three years' time or a year's time. It's two months' time. So I'd like to just talk through two examples. So for example, the first example with identity, let's remove the digital part. So identity, how do you know that your best friend is who they say they are? And you would say, well, it's a silly question. I mean, I know them. But it's because you formed a relationship with them. So maybe the first time you met them, you didn't know them. They say, hi, I'm Amy. You recognize their face, and you remember it, right? And then over the gradual progression of your relationship, you exchange small parts of information, um, you have a conversation, and you learn to trust each other. And it's in this way that you start to form really interesting relationships, and you actually start to know who they are. And now here's another example. So when I deal with my enterprises, so I banked with my bank for about 15 years, right? I turned up with my mother, who's also banked at that bank for over 20 years. I have to bring in my passport to verify who I am to that bank the first time I interact with them. Any other point that I want to deal with them, I have to prove that I am who I say that I am with my passport. And why is this? There's no relationship, there's no memory, and there's no trust. So when we're starting to talk about the ways we can create these new digital experiences, don't think about creating a, digital, a passport that we put online that verifies who I am and that I can verify myself online. Think about how can we create a relationship with my personal data to create these really new and really interesting experiences <coughs> that will delight people around you and make things more fun, less frictionful, and smoother. So if we just step back a little bit, um, obviously the world has changed. We know that there's been a digital revolution. Uh, the consumerization of devices has occurred. There is now more power in the hands of the consumer than at any point in history. Um, an interesting statistic is that 56% of millennials use their phone to shop in store. They have access to the internet at any point in time, and you as a company cannot compete with this. <laughs> there are also social digital natives, i.e. millennials, me. Um, and if you have any of these at home, if you have children, uh, you'll know that they behave a little bit differently. Uh, they're always connected, they're rather demanding, they want things in instantaneously, and you really have to be in your best game to satisfy them. And so how do you do this? Well, one of the great ways to do this is to not think about product. Don't think just about price. Think about how you as an enterprise can begin to stage experiences. How can you delight these people? Um, how can you create something that excites them, makes them happy, makes them feel something? Um, and create a sense of fun and a, a sense of experience. And that's how you'll create really sticky relationships with people. And now, obviously, we've had the financial crisis in 2008. Um, we're, we're in a new normal. That's never going to change. Um, we also have stricter regulations, especially around banking. Um, so these are just some new structures that we need to work within when we're creating these new great experiences. So now, down the bottom, you can see an old industrial era, era value chain. Now, this is the way business has been done since the 1800s. This was created before women were allowed to vote. <laughs> I think we can all agree that the world has moved on. The customer is shoved right to the end. Great, in the days of snail mail, before internet, before email, fine. Not a problem. However, this doesn't work today. The customer is empowered, they're demanding, you need to include them. So let's break this broken chain and let's put the customer at the center. And now, once you put the customer at the center, truly put the customer at the center, not at the center of your product, at the center of everything that you do. So the customer is at the center, and we can start to wrap the value chain around them. This gives the customer a place to stand on the internet, a centralized location for all their data to be stored. So the problem with apps and with silos and with the way the world works today, all my data is siloed across multiple organizations across multiple apps. You never get a real version of me as an individual. So what you can start to do is create a centralized location. They can start to pull the things they want to them. They can push information to the brands that they wish to have a relationship with. And in this way, they get exactly what they want when they want it. 
And I think for some of the basic terms that I would use to describe these kind of interactions is make it intelligent. So don't make them too, do too much work. Hyper-personalization, so not just personalization, but down to a real segment of one, me as an individual, not just female, uh, 20 to 25, and lives in New Zealand. Um, and also make it ambient. People no longer want to log on to a portal. They want to be able to access things through these little devices at any point in time. So it's these kind of things that you need to keep in mind, I suppose. And then also, when you're starting to create these new experiences, uh, what we encourage is to look at things through the customer's eyes. See things as they would see them. Because that gives you an incredible insight into where the shortfall might be. Look at what are their jobs to be done? What are those end-to-end -end outcomes that an individual is trying to achieve? Um, an example of this and what some of the work that we've been doing is with a bank saying, well, does an individual want to get a mortgage or do they want to get a home? And I would argue that you don't go to a bank and get a mortgage to sit on $2 million of cash. What you want to do is you want to get a home, and you want to get things for the home, and you want to get insurance for that home. And so there's these end-to-end -end outcomes that you can start to create to really uh, create a great experience for your customer, create a very sticky experience. And what we call it is love is a lock-in strategy. Just make their life so easy and simple that they will love you forever. Um, and obviously, anytime, anywhere, you've got demanding millennials. They're going to be the biggest consumer group out there at the moment. Um, so this is something you also need to pay attention to. Um, and always try and create an experience. Make it exciting. Make it fun. Make it enjoyable. Uh, this is an example of a project that we're actually working on. So I'm bringing it back to this identity sense. So, a bank down in New Zealand has partnered with the New Zealand Post Office. So the New Zealand Post Office gets all your bills. But what they do is they print them and they send them out to you in a, in a paper format. But imagine if those bills could be put into your personal cloud as a consumer. You have ownership and control of that. And then as a bank, it allows you to pay all your bills with a single tap. If there's a bill that's not in there, you scan a barcode, you upload it, and you just pay that bill with a single tap. And then here, the bank itself can become more than a bank. It can move up its own value chain to become an everyday bank. And on the one side, a bank has businesses. And on the other side, that bank has consumers. And you can start to connect those together. And because you've been onboarded by such a bank, you have verified it as an individual. Because I've gone through it. I've given you my passport. And so digital tokens can then be extended to any interaction that you have within that network or within that ecosystem to verify that you are who you say you are. And it's these kind of interactions and these kind of ecosystems that are the future. And once again, intelligent, personalized, and ambient. Huh. My clicker. Did you? Is it going? Ah. And so just as identity is being disintermediated, so is the traditional digital experience. Um, nobody wants to log on and enter information into a web website anymore. Nobody finds that interesting. So why not have an intelligent assistant that learns about you, that knows you, that does anything that an assistant that you would normally have, like a person would do, to fill in all your forms and do all those boring things that you don't want to do? And now there are many, many examples that are emerging out of, out of the United States, some out of Europe. Um, our personal assistant at MyWay, Frank, he's a brilliant example of this. Um, so what I'm going to show you is how we're using Frank, just as an example, so you can get to see how these kind of interactions are taking place in the real world today. And so you can start to see that Frank, is, so Frank becomes your personal assistant. You as an individual own and control your information. And you can start to create ecosystems around yourself and your assistant uh, with businesses around travel, automotive, retail, loyalty, banking, utilities, anything that you interact with in your normal life that work around you to make your life easier, make your life simpler, and um, to just help you in everything that you do. And they can also interact with the Internet of Things, the Internet of Everything, um, anything that you wish. So here is a real world example. This is going live in November of this year down in New Zealand. So what we've done is we've actually partnered with a uh, startup energy fourth party. 
And so what they do is that they, whenever a better power price becomes available, we're switching businesses to a better power rate. And now what they've done with Frank is they've said, well, hey, Frank can become your personal power assistant and switch you to a better rate whenever one becomes available and it's all automated. Now, obviously, there's a great proposition for the consumer. Frank manages your power. He puts in the best plan and the best price. He makes your life easier. You have your personal cloud, what your bills and information are. It's effortless and provides insight. Now, when we went to speak to the power retailers about this, there was silence in the room. <laughs> I know what you're thinking, but no. So what was really interesting, they said, you know what? We thought we had three years from now to think about this, but it's here now. And we're like, yes. And this is true for any enterprise that we speak to. But what they actually start to get out of it is acquisition. So instead of creating a great spray and pray campaign, and uh, they're spending millions of dollars on this, they can start to acquire customers. And because they start to know that customer down to a segment of one, they can choose who they wish to acquire, uh, the high value customers, et cetera, et cetera. And they can offer deals and promotions down the network. In terms of retention, so they obviously have retention teams, which I would argue were not particularly successful. But through the platform, they can now know when someone is about to switch. And they can also choose to offer them a deal or promotion to retain them. So I'll just show you two videos quickly. Can we play the consumer video that show how this works? And now, I'll just go quickly and show you some more examples of what Frank is doing. So in the automotive, retail, and financial services industry, Frank can find you your car, he can get you the finance, he can get you the insurance, and he can get you the registration without filling in forms, and in simple, frictionless manner. If this was frictionless, that would be great. Um, so real estate, we're working on a really cool project up in Australia, coming soon to a place near you. Um, where we're disrupting the real estate market. So Frank become, helps you find a house. Here, there's a subscription model where you can subscribe to building inspection reports so you don't have to buy one for every single house that you want to look at. Um, he helps you uh, with frictionless home loans. Uh, you don't have to fill in forms because he knows you. He just autofills anything that he already knows about you. Um, and helps you get into the home, helps you find removal lists, any of the services that you need around moving into a new home. Travel and tourism, he can book your holiday, he can find you the flights that you like, get you the seats that you want, show you around the country, 
he can be your personal tour guide. Banking payments and loyalty, well this is uh, part of what I was speaking about earlier, but he can, make, he can allow you to pay your bills in just a few taps. And um, that's all I have today, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys might have. Thank you very much, Amy. And no uh, look, uh, after seeing this presentation, I guess we all agree that digital identity is a space which is ripe for innovation. Uh, it's just amazing to see what scenarios can be enabled by it. Uh, so I saw a first question here. I'm going to hand over my microphone. Let's try to go for short and uh, quick questions. All right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Joshua from uh, Just Digital People. Oh, wonderful. And look, um, I'm not racist or anything. In fact, some of my best friends are robots. <laughs> but um, I'm a little bit concerned, like what happens if I give my digital identity to a robot and he decides to run away with it? And also, what happens when they do microsecond power trading and like the whole power grid melts down? <laughs> well, the, um, the brilliant thing around Frank is that he's your personal assistant. The data is owned and controlled by you. You can't run away with it. Um, and also, he switches you about every two weeks. Um, and it's also self-regulating. So once you switch to the power provider, there'll be a certain number that can actually switch before their power, um, their power excess is used up and that their price will go up. So it's actually a self-regulating market in terms of the switching model. Thank you. A question at the back. Hi, I'm Grant. Um, two questions, and I'll make them quick. Okay. One, what is the difference between Frank and an old-fashioned uh, website aggregator? And two, if you are aggregating data to build persona, how many uh, contact points are you using? Uh, well, the first question, um, what is the difference between an old website? Well, Frank learns about you. So, right, so like with a website, like I go on and I enter my details, maybe I do something wrong, I click a button, it deletes everything, and it's lost forever. Uh, Frank, for example, you enter your details once, he remembers it, and then with any interaction that you have with any other vendor, um, he remembers that for them as well. So you never have to key in the same information more than once. Um, and that is a huge differentiator, especially if you've been interacting with them for a while and then you go and fill out your mortgage form. Um, a bank today will still ask you to fill out your name multiple times with whatever you're doing. Uh, what was that second question, sorry? How many data points are you collecting that you build personas? Um, as, many as, the, as many as the required, really. Um, it depends on the use case that we're building. Uh, we use a Neo4j uh, database, so it all just connects via nodes. Um, and it's really as many da data points are as needed to create the experience. One last question at the back over there. Oh, was there? Yep. I'm sorry, we just promised the microphone <laughs> there. So Amy will be back. So yeah. I will be back. So any other questions? Hi, I'm uh, Shaker from PetCloud, which yep. is uh, pretty much Airbnb for pet owners. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Uh, so my question was. Uh, <laughs> wow. Oh, wow. You sound popular. Okay, yeah. really. Okay. Coming back to the question, so uh, my question was uh, I saw, you, I was watching the videos on your website while the presentation, but there was nothing for businesses. So, how different is the product when it comes to businesses? Okay, so in terms of the businesses, what we actually start to offer are real, is real-time market data. So anything that you're doing on the consumer side, um, if you choose to opt in and share that with a business, um, you, they, they get insight into what you're doing now, what you're doing next, what you're looking for, what your price points are. And then what they can start to do is offer you real-time offers and promotions on the network, and actually you can start to get a better deal. Um, I think there is one video, but yeah, we don't show a lot of the, of the business side, but there was a little bit on the Save What side where the power retailer starts to see which, which people are switching, um, and they can start to offer better deals also down the network as well. So anything that you see on the consumer side, there is a, there's a business side on the other side as well. Right. Thank you very much, Amy.